Hello and welcome to the course Motion Detection using Python and OpenCV. My name is Jonas Granatier and I will teach all the lectures of the course. As the name suggests, the objective is to detect any type of movement in videos, as if we were simulating security systems. Now, I am going to show you the content that will be covered. You will learn the intuition about background subtraction, which is the only technique that will be covered in this course. It does not use complex concepts of artificial neural networks and deep learning, so it is very simple to implement using OpenCV library. The advantage is that you don't need to have advanced knowledge to create your own projects. You will learn the basic intuition about the following algorithms. Temporal Median Filter, MOG, GMG, KNN, and CNT. Then, we will implement each one step by step and compare the quality and performance. This way, you can choose the best algorithm according to the project you are working on. After, you will learn several techniques for image processing, because when we work in this area, it is important to use them to improve the quality of the detections. After understanding each algorithm, we will implement three very interesting practical projects. The first one is a simple motion detection in the area of monitoring, so we will be able to monitor the environment. The second one is very interesting. We will print a warning if people are not respecting social distance rules, very useful in pandemic scenarios. Finally, we are going to implement a vehicle counter. The idea is to count how many cars and how many trucks are passing by the road. All implementations will be done step by step using Python and PyCharm IDE as you can see here. I'm going to show each one of the projects. This is project number one. The goal is to monitor the environment. In this case, it is a garden of a house and there are some animals that are visiting the garden during the night and during the day. The goal is to detect these objects so you can print this message, motion detected. It is a very interesting project because you can use this code to implement your own security system. If something appears in the environment, in this case in the garden, you can trigger an alarm, call the police and so on. Now I'm going to show you the second project regarding social distance. Let's run it. We can take a look at this video with a lot of people walking. If people are together or walking very close, we can see this message. I will run this code again. For example, two people are walking together, so the system will trigger this alarm indicating that they are not respecting the social distance rules. Finally, Regarding project 3, we are going to implement the car and the trucks counter. You can see here all the code that will be implemented step by step. I will run the project. We can see the initial frame of the video. And now we need to select a ROI or a region of interest. When we press a key on the keyboard, 
the system will start counting. We can see the messages indicating that a car has been detected. And here we can count the number of cars and also the number of trucks. A truck is approaching the road. And we could see the message truck. And here the counter is working properly. 27 cars and only one truck. And you can also choose the algorithm. For example, in this part of the code at the top, you can choose GMG, MOG, MOG2, KNN, and CNT. It is interesting because you can choose the best one according to the project you are working with. Regarding the requirements, you need to know about programming logic and basic Python programming. It is important to emphasize that during this course, you are going to learn only the basic intuition about the algorithms, because the focus is on the practical implementations. And we are not going to use deep learning. The algorithms are all based on background subtraction which is a simple technique in the area of computer vision. However, you can develop very interesting projects. This course is for all levels. If you are a beginner or if you have knowledge about computer vision and you want to learn this new technique. Again, welcome to this course. We hope you enjoy the content and have a lot of ideas on how to implement your own projects. See you in the next lecture. Hello and welcome to this lecture where you are going to learn some concepts about what background subtraction is. Background subtraction is any technique that allows the foreground of the image to be extracted for further processing. The background of this image here has several trees and the horse is in the foreground. The goal of this technique is to identify what is the background and what is the foreground. So, it is possible to perform the extraction according to this example. If you want to identify or recognize objects, you can disregard all the background of the image to extract only the object. You can see this other image with these people walking in the park. Note that the background is composed of some trees, some buildings, and other people behind. The objective is to extract only the people and the dog, as you can see here. This is the basic idea of this technique. During the course, you will learn several techniques to subtract the background of images. There are several applications that can be developed using background subtraction. For example, monitoring a given scenario. Let's suppose that there is a house in the background of the image and a person suddenly appears. So, an alarm can be triggered because maybe there is a thief. It can also be used for object tracking. After the algorithm identifies the object, could be the horse here, another algorithm can be used to track the horse during the video. Another application is the recognition of objects such as pedestrians that can be used in the development of self-driving cars. Object segmentation, which is basically separating the object from the background of the image 
as we can see here. Another very interesting application that we are going to implement step by step is counting the number of people or counting the number of vehicles. For example, to know how many people were present at a certain event or to know how many vehicles are traveling on a certain road. Nowadays, deep learning techniques have contributed enormously to the field of computer vision and object detection, mainly using GPUs for efficient computing, making it easier to build complex applications. However, there are some computer vision techniques that are quite simple, but work very well until today. This is the objective of the course. We are going to work with these techniques. So, you will be able to develop some basic applications without the need of powerful servers or to train a neural network from scratch. The knowledge of these algorithms can give you a good idea of what you can achieve with very simple techniques. All of them are based on analyzing the background. First, it is necessary to identify the background of the image, and then, we can detect the changes that occur over time. Background subtraction is based on the assumption that the background of the image is static, which can lead to some problems when there are variations in the external environment, such as rain, wind, ice, and so on. You should not use these techniques if you have a camera recording the landscape in a moving car, as the scenario or the background will change in each frame of the video. These techniques have good results when the background is static. For example, if you are monitoring the garden of a house, the image of the garden is static, and what varies are the objects that can appear in the garden. To make it easier to understand, let's view a video when the camera is not static. I will play the video. The background is not the same, or in other words, the camera may be static inside the car, but the background is moving. This other video shows how a background subtraction algorithm would behave. Almost all objects are detected because the background is moving. So, these algorithms are not suitable for this type of scenario. The other videos show when the background is not static, when there are effects like water, wind, vegetation, rain, snow, and so on. We can see the goose in the center, however, it is difficult to detect movement because there is the effect of the rain on the water. In other words, the background is not static. This other image shows the scenario in black and white. See that it is difficult to detect movements because the background is moving. The green lines here indicate the detections, which, as we can see, are being made in the whole image. In summary, in these examples, we can conclude that it is difficult for the algorithm to detect what is the background 
And what is the foreground of the image? It is important to emphasize that this is not an error in the algorithm. It is just a limitation in this technique. Now we can see the pipeline or the sequence of steps of the algorithm. The video frames are sent at the beginning of the process, keeping in mind that a video is a sequence of frames, and each frame is an image. In summary, we send several images so that in the first stage, the background generation, the default background image is generated, processing n frames to generate the background. Let's assume that the goal is to create a security system to monitor the guarding to detect thieves. The guarding is always the same. It is a static image, such as trees, benches, and so on. This is the default background image that the algorithm will learn in the first step. When a person appears, the image will change and will be different from the default image, which will characterize a movement. The second stage is background modeling, which indicates the static image of the environment. From time to time, it is necessary to update the background model to handle changes over time. For example, we have this wall, which is the initial image sent to the algorithm, which was chosen as the background image. Supposing that at any given time, someone hangs a clock on that wall. Initially, the algorithm will indicate that the clock is a movement, as it is something different from the original image. It will return what is the background, which is the wall, and what is the foreground which is the clock or the movement that was detected. After some time, the algorithm will have to adapt itself to the new image and will consider both the wall and the clock as the default background. In short, if the person puts on and takes off the watch, it is considered movement, otherwise it will be considered as the new background. Finally, the last step is foreground detection, which is the last one. The image pixels are divided between background and foreground. What is the background and what is the detected movement? generating the foreground mask at the end of the process. It will be easier to understand when we implement this process step by step. We can take a look at some other images. See here the background model or the default image, the C. When a boat appears here, both images will be compared or subtracted. We can see here the threshold. If the value of the subtraction, considering all the pixels of the images, is greater than the threshold, which is defined by the user, we can get the foreground mask which actually is the detection. We can see here that the background is in black and the foreground is in white. So, motion will be detected since 
the current frame is different from the background model. We can see this other image here. We have the input stream, which can be a video or a set of images. Then we extract the background model, which is the environment without the person. We subtract both images. We have the result of the subtraction when we compare the background model with the input stream. What is different is only the person. So motion can be detected by subtracting the background model and the input stream. We apply the threshold and we have here the output masks. Finally, this is the same images of the other slides where we can extract only the horse, the people and the dogs. In the next lecture, you are going to understand the basic intuition of the first background subtraction algorithm. See you there! Hello and welcome to this lecture, where you are going to learn the basic intuition about the first algorithm for background subtraction, which is temporal median filter. The pixel intensity is calculated using the function vxyt, where t is the time dimension. As I mentioned in previous lecture, a video is a set of frames. Each frame is an image. Therefore, we need to extract multiple samples from the video over time. For example, in a 30 second video, we can extract a sample at 10 seconds another at 15 seconds, and so on. X and Y are the variables that indicate the location of the pixels, as an image is basically a matrix of pixels with rows and columns. For example, V123 is the pixel intensity at the location 1 and 2, positions x and y. t equal to 3 indicates that the sample was captured at 3 seconds of video. This equation is used to calculate the background of the image, remembering that the first step of the algorithm is the extraction of the default background. Don't worry about understanding all the calculations because the idea is just for you to have an overview of how the calculations are performed. The letter B indicates background, which is what will be extracted through this equation. V indicates the pixel intensity. X and Y is the pixel position, and T minus I indicates that we will extract the previous frame to perform the calculations. This is necessary so that changes in the image are identified like the example of the clock on the wall that was mentioned in the previous lecture. If the clock is placed and kept on the wall, it will be part of the new image background. After the pixels are extracted, the sum is made. This symbol here, letter N, indicates the number of frames that will be used to generate the background image. A default value for this parameter is 25 for small videos. So, 25 sample frames will be extracted 
to generate the background image. The result of the sum is divided by the number of frames, this part of the equation here. It is a simple calculation, according to the name of the algorithm, temporal median filter. We can read here, n in the equation is the number of previous images for the average calculation. In short, this whole part of the equation is an average calculation that takes past frames into account. To capture the changes in the frames, we can compare the background found by the algorithm, this part here, with the frame in the previous time. If it is the same, there are no changes. On the other hand, if it is different, there are changes and consequently motion detection. This is the comparison needed in order to detect motion. After the background is calculated, we can subtract from the image V in time T and limit it to the threshold TH. This equation is used to detect movements. The original image subtracted from the background. This calculation is applied to each video frame. For example, if there are 50 frames, the calculation will be performed 50 times. These bars at the beginning and end indicate that we are not going to consider whether the number is positive or negative. It is the absolute difference. In the end, we can see that the result must be greater than the threshold. For example, we can rewrite the equation here. This is the current frame in which we want to detect objects. We will subtract the background, which in this case is the empty road. The objective of the algorithm is to analyze the frames to generate this background which will be compared to all other frames of the video. We can take a look at this video. It has one minute, and the idea is to extract several samples, for example, 25, to get the median. That is a statistical concept that indicates the value at the center of a distribution. We can see that what is repeated the most in this video are the static elements, the trees, the sign, and the road. The cars are elements that are passing through the background. They are temporary. So, when we apply the algorithm to extract the samples from the video, we will only have this image without any temporary elements. The elements that appear the most in the frames will be extracted. Each car takes about 5 or 6 seconds to cross the road. From here to here, they are transient objects and are not frequent in the video. Motion will be detected in places where there are many changes in the pixels. For example, this part of the image where the white car is will be compared with the same position of the background image. When the subtraction is performed, the difference will be large. Therefore, 
motion will be detected. Considering these other parts of the road down here, note that the subtraction value will be very small, which will not characterize something new in the image. For example, there are 25 background estimates if 25 frames for training are used. The training is to find the default background image that will be used. We can see here N frames. When implementing temporal median filter, the user must specify the number of sample frames which will be used for training. See that at the end of the image here, there is, in this part where I am pointing the mouse, there is as if it were a defect or the beginning of a contour of a car. It happens because it is in this position of the image that the cars begin to appear when playing the video. This is because we are extracting 25 background samples. So, it could happen that there will be vehicles in some of those 25 frames. This is why some pixels related to vehicles may appear. After the calculation, the background model is generated. This is the background model or the median frame. At each new input image or frame, the algorithm compares each pixel with the median value of the created model. And just a reminder that the background model or the median frame will be generated using the median for each pixel. It will be easier to understand this process when we implement the algorithm step by step. Now we can take a look at the steps of the algorithm. The first one is to convert the background template to grayscale. I'm open the W3Schools RGB calculator just to perform some tests. As you may know, an image is composed of three color channels, RGB. The combination of these values will generate a new color. For example, R83, G55, and B130. This combination of numbers will lead to this color here. We can see there are three values that need to be stored. I will change all the values to the same number. The result will be a grayscale image. So it means that when the values are the same, we always will get a grayscale image. Let's try to change here, 150, 150. The result is again a grayscale image. So, we can conclude that it is not necessary to store the information about all the channels, the RGB, when we have a grayscale image. It is necessary to store only one number since all of them are the same. In short, it is recommended to convert the images to grayscale, so the processing time will be faster since we are considering only one value or channel instead of three values. After the conversion, step number two is to loop all the frames of the video. We extract the current frame and convert it to grayscale. 
all the calculations will be performed considering grayscale images. Step number three, calculate the absolute difference between the current frame and the background model. Finally, apply thresholds to remove noise and binarize the output only 0 or 1 or 0 and 255. We use 0 and 255 because they are the minimum and maximum values of the pixels. For example, only 0 is the black color, 255, 255, and 255 is the white color. We can use these values to convert the image to black and white. We can take a look at this image here. It can be considered the current frame. We have step number one, which is the generation of the background model. Then we calculate the absolute difference between them for each one of the frame, we need to loop all of them. If there are 50 frames, we need to perform the calculation 50 times. Then we can see the result, which is the binarized output, considering only 0 and 1 or 0 and 255. In the implementation lecture, we will have this result. It will be possible to detect only the objects and see that in the most part of the video, the background is black. Finally, we can check out more information about this algorithm. It is not very efficient. Accuracy depends on the speed speeds of the motion. Faster motions require higher thresholds. In the practical lectures, we will perform some tests using the thresholds. It will be easier to understand. Moving background objects can be considered as permanent objects in the foreground not good with gradual lighting changes in the sand, the solution for some of these problems is another algorithm, which is the adaptive background modeling, which is a more efficient algorithm. In the next lecture, we are going to start the implementation step by step of temporal median filter. So, we will recap this intuition lecture, and right after, we will move on to more efficient algorithms. See you there! Hello and welcome to this lecture, where I am going to show you how you can install Anaconda and PyCharm on your own machine. Both tools will be used during the whole course. The first step is to access the Anaconda website, as you can see here. Select the operating system according to your computer and click on Download. An installation file will be downloaded and you must run it and follow the instructions. I am not going to show you this process step by step because it is basically following the instructions on the screen. In case you don't know Anaconda, it is one of the most used tools for programming in Python and especially for working with artificial intelligence and data science. The advantage is that several AI-specific libraries are already installed and it is also possible to create environments with different versions of Python. For example, one environment using Python 2 and another environment with Python 3. 
One environment does not influence the other. The next step is to install PyCharm, as you can see here. JetBrains.com PyCharm downloads. It is an IDE for working with Python. Let's choose and download the free version, which is called Community. An installation file will be downloaded, and you must run it and follow the instructions. Again, I'm not going to show you this process step by step, because it is basically following the instructions on the screen. Then, you can open PyCharm, and a window similar to this one will be opened. I will click on New Project. You need to select the location. In my case, Search Project. This is the folder where all the files will be saved. Click on New Environment using Conda. We are going to use the tool we have just installed. Python version 3.10. I will click on Create to create the new project. We can see the information regarding the project. To perform a test, we can create a new Python file. The name of the file will be Test. And let's send a message. Print testing the project. Click on Run Test. We can see that the message has been shown, so the project was successfully created. In the next lecture, we are going to start the implementation. See you there! Hello and welcome to this lecture, where we are going to start the implementation of the first algorithm, Temporal Median Filter. I will create a new file, Python file, the name of the file will be temporal median filter. The first step is to import some libraries that we are going to use. Import numpy as np, numpy is a scientific library in Python to work with matrices, vectors, and we can also use some mathematical calculations. The next library, import cv2. This is open cv library, which means open computer vision. It has some features to read and show the images. As we can see here, an error is being returned. Since both libraries are not installed, we need to install it by clicking in Terminal, to install NumPy, we need to type pip install NumPy. Press Enter. Let's wait until the installation is complete. We can see the library is being downloaded and installed. The next one is OpenCV. pip install OpenCV Python. OpenCV will be used to call all the background subtraction algorithms. As we can see here, the library has been correctly installed. Just to make sure no error will be returned, we can click on Run Temporal Median Filter. See that no error message has been shown here. It means that both libraries were correctly installed. To check the version, let's print cv2 version run. This code again, we are using version 4.7.0. Make sure to use the same version in order to not have any error. I will create a new variable video source it will be equal to videos bar cars.mp4. This is the file that we are going to use to test the algorithm. 
we are going to create a new folder, new directory. The name of the directory is videos. We are going to save all the videos in this folder. You have access to all the videos in the course materials. I'm going to copy cars.mp4 and just paste it here. Click OK. See that the video was successfully copied to the project. I will create a new variable, video out, because when we process the video, we are going to generate a new one with the results. It will be saved on the following folder, videos, results, and the name of the video will be temporal median filter dot avi. We can even create this new directory. Results, all the results videos will be saved here. In order to read the video, we need to create the cap variable, which means capture. Let's call OpenCV. CV2, we are going to use this class, video capture, and we just need to send the path to the video, video source. I will create two new variables, has frame and frame equals cap dot read. This function will read the first frame of the video. As you already know, a video is a sequence of a lot of frames, and each frame is an image. Let's print has frame and frame dot shape. I will run this cell of code. We can see here the message true, which means that it was possible to read the first frame of the video. If the result is false, it means that an error was returned. So you need to check the path of the video. In the second variable, we can see the data about the first frame of the video. 720 by 1280 pixels. It is the shape or the dimensions of the video. Number 3 here means the number of channels. As the video is colored, there are three channels. One for red, for green, and for blue. Just to recap, we are using this video here that was covered in the intuition lectures. I will create a new variable for cc equals cv2, I will access this new class, video writer for cc. It will be used to save the new video that will be generated. I will type here xvid, which means the format regarding avi video. In other words, this variable means the codec. Let's create the writer equals cv2. Let's call video writer class. The first parameter is video out, which means the output for the video. The second parameter for cc, the codec. The third parameter means the frames by seconds. I will keep the default value, 25 frames will be stored for each second of video. The higher the value, the faster the video. The next parameter is the dimensions. Frame dot shape in position 1, position 0 is this value, this one here is position 1. Then we need to specify frame dot shape in position 0. 
720. Finally, the last parameter equals false. It means that only grayscale frames will be considered. If we change here to true, the processing will be done in the colored image. In short, it is as if we were converting the frames to grayscale. If you want to know more details about the parameters, you can follow this link to check out the documentation. We can print more information about the video. Let's print cap.get and let's type here cv2 and we can access cap prop frame count. It will return the number of frames in the video. We can see here the result is 3000. It means that in this one minute video there are 3000 thousand frames or three thousand images. As you have learned in the intuition lectures, the goal of temporal median filter is to get a sample of the frames in order to create the default background that will be used to compare with the video. It is this part of the slide we need to select some sample frames to create the background model or the median frame. For example, there are 25 background estimates or 25 frames if 25 frames for training are used. As we discussed in the intuition lecture, this is a default value that can be used for short videos as the one we are going to test. So, we need to select 25 random frames from the video. In short, there are 3000 frames in the video and we need to randomly select only 25 of them. We can create the variable frames id equals cap dot get. Let's type here cv2 cap prop frame count. I will multiply by np dot random dot uniform size equals 25. Before running this code, we can get only this part, the random uniform. I will paste this code here and let's print just to perform a test. So it will be easier to understand the results. I will run this code. See that 25 random numbers were generated. The numbers range from 0 to 1. As we can see here, every time we run this code, we will get different numbers, since it is a random process. In short, we are generating 25 numbers that will be used to extract the sample frames. We are using uniform function which is a concept from statistics. I have opened Google Images search just to you to better understand what is the uniform distribution. We can compare the normal distribution here, the graph on the left, and the graph on the right shows the uniform distribution. We can clearly see that the probability of selecting a value is the same in all the areas of the graph, from minus 2 to 2. It means that the probability is the same for selecting any number in this interval. On the other hand, if we use the normal distribution from minus 3 to 3, 
there is a higher probability of selecting these numbers in this interval in the center, from minus 1 to 1, and the probability to select the numbers on the left and on the right side is lower. For this reason, we are using the uniform distribution, because we need the same probability for selecting the random frames of the video. Now we can uncomment this line of codes. We are getting the frame count, 3000, and we are multiplying by the random numbers. At the end, we can print frames IDs. I will put all these other prints in commands, and here with OpenCV version. When we multiply the random numbers by 3000, we will get the IDs of the frames. For example, we are going to select frame number 1459, frame 397, frame 1921, and so on. This is the list of frames that will be selected to build the background model. And just a reminder again, every time we run this code, we will get different numbers. Now we can visualize some of these sample frames. Cap.set, let's type here, cv2, cap, prop, Pause. Frames, we need to specify the total amount of frames, and we can type this number here. Frame number 2632. I will create the variable has frame and frame equals cap dot read. Here we are specifying the frame we are going to read. And after, we are reading this specific frame. Let's call the function from OpenCV, cv2.imshow. We need to specify the name of the window, test, and the frame. At the end, cv2, wake key 0. When we press a key, the window will be closed. We can see here that this is the specific frame we have just selected. It will be used to build the background model. We can take a look at some other frames. For example, frame number 8 to 5. Let's type here. Run the code again. See that we are selecting a different frame. What we need to do now is to create a list of frames to store each one of the 25 random frames that will be selected from the video. I will create an empty list for FID in frame IDs cap dot set cv2 cap prop pause frames let's send here f id we are going through frames ids which is the list with the corresponding ids we need to read the frame has frame and frame cap dot read and finally frames dot append frame. We are putting all the frames in the list. After we run this code, we can print frames dot shape. Let's run this code. See that one error has been returned. List object has no attribute frame because it is in the format of a list and we need to convert to the NumPy array. After that, we can visualize the shape. Let's run 
the codes again. Every time we run, we will get different frames. We can see here 25 frames, the dimensions and the number of channels. We can even print frames in position 0. Run this code again. We will see different numbers here. We can see that one matrix is being shown and the values are in the range from 0 to 255, the range of the RGB color space. In short, the pixels are being shown here. We can visualize another frame. Different pixels will be shown as we can see here. Finally, we can perform the last test just to go through each one of the selected frames. For frame, in frames, CV2, I am show the name of the window, frame and frame, CV2, wait key 0. Let's run these codes. We can visualize the index of the frames and every time we press any key on the keyboard, we will visualize the frames. Just a reminder that 25 random frames are being selected. Those frames will be used in order to generate the background model. We can see that the background of the image, such as the roads, the trees are static, and what varies is the cars that are passing by the road. This is the first step of the algorithm, the selection of the 25 random frames. In the next lecture, we are going to continue the implementation. See you there!